So my paper is called before I begin, I would also like to say a little bit about what has transpired so far, which is that we, we've had three talks. Um, the first two were regarding a text by uh, Avalindranath. Both of them were about texts, actually. Uh, the first one was his text on aesthetics called Bhageshwari Lecture, which is lectures on art that he gave. And Dr. Shankar Banerjee was talking about how that text is actually challenging some of the norms of humans. And Shoykot followed that by talking about another text. And these are uh, sort of mid-career works, also towards the end of Obrindurat, so late mid-career works. Um, his it's, te it's a text on his uh, study of folk designs, alpona, which are related to rituals. So I, I will draw on some of these in my talk itself, and we can discuss it more later. And Dr. Gupto was talking about, and even later, as he pointed out in the chronology, 1930 to 1935, uh, around the time of the Second World War, um, He's writing folk plays, Jatra. A Jatra is a folk play. And he's using this form, uh, just like he's using the form of the, of the, of the Alpona, which is a folk, uh, you know, designs done in rituals uh, of the people, popular rituals. These are not Vedic rituals. These are rituals that belong to people and they're participatory rituals, not mediated rituals. And so similarly, you find that in this uh, text, we are talking about plays that are done by the people in which grand characters like Rama are turned into common people of the street. So Kuddur Chakra, Kuddur Ramayon, uh, Kuddur means little, of the little, the, the book of the little Ramas. And the characters in there are shopkeeper Rama or seller Rama, buyer Rama, and things like that. See, so this is a way, at, as Dr. Gupta pointed out, of uh, bringing the epic and the grand into the modern and the, you know, commonplace. Uh, so my uh, talk is about the final phase of Obanindranath's work, which goes from 1941 to 1951. This is the last phase of his life. It's called Obanindranath's Found Wood Relatives, Narration, Nomadic Subjectivity, and Transsubjectivity in Multimedia Rituals of Destitution and Restitution. We also learned about the multimedia aspect of his work already from most of these talks that he's mixing media, he's mixing senses, and these are each given a certain independence that they're, they're allowed to dialogue with one another. This is part of the postmodernity of his work. So in 1938, Abhinindranath Tagore's elder brother Gaganendranath was also an artist died after eight years of paralysis. In 1941, his uncle Rabindranath followed. He also died in 1941. Later that year, Abhinindranath moved from his ancestral home, 5 Dwarkanath Tagore Lane, to a rented mansion, Gupta Nibash, in Varanagar, which is an area towards the outskirts, uh, the suburbs of Kolkata. That same year, shortly after his move, his wife, Suhasini Devi, his life companion for 53 years, passed away. And in a couple of years, in 1943, the ancestral house of the Tagores, the Jorashanko Tagores, was sold. These changes represented the end of an era for Abhinindana. The crumbling of a communitarian manifestation related to the forces of history. 
It could be considered the end of what flowered as the Bengal Renaissance in regional and national history and the end of a feudal aristocracy with the advent of the Second World War. It presaged the arrival of a new phase of modernity, that of capitalist individualism and the politics of nation states. Post-colonial nationalism may largely be thought to replicate the humanist image of the cogito, that is, the human as independent rational subject, albeit in an ethnocentric flavor. So there's an ethnocentricism to it, but the image of the human remains the same. It's a the rational subject. I have argued elsewhere that Agunindranath's cultural nationalism proposed an alternate dialogic idea of the nation. Now, Dr. Shantanu Banerjee mentioned that uh, fact and the book that I wrote about it called The Alternate Nation of Abhulindranath Thakur, where he is proposing a different kind of nationalism. And I don't have time to go into that right now, but maybe we'll touch on some of that as we go along. One, in which the senses were delinked from the cogito. So this is something we've seen already in all the works that we've been introduced to. The senses, it is not as if the, the cogito, the thinking aspect of the mind, the, the, the rational ego, is uniting the senses. It is not uniting the senses and giving them a certain unified subjectivity. It is allowed to let the senses free so that what we have are independent approaches to reality from each of the senses. The senses were delinked from the cogito and put into historical dialogue with one another. Each one is experiencing the world as a different historical phenomenology. We see this from the very start in the calligraphic intertextuality of his Krishna Leela paintings. So, uh, so again, I'm not going to go into depth with this. This is all in my, in my book, but these are his earliest paintings. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, we heard some talks on uh, art related to Krishna. This is one of the scenes uh, from Krishna's uh, dalliances with the gopis, with Radha and the gopis, uh, it's called Nau Bihar. Uh, and the name there, Nau Bihar, is written on the top in Bengali. And actually the naming is interesting and important because the name belongs to the texts of singing, Kirtan, Pala Kirtan, you know, where they sang episodes from the life of Krishna. And you see, under almost half the page is made up with this calligraphic writing. So this is part of that delinking of the senses. You have, you have the vision and you have the text. But the text is also visual. It's calligraphic. And there is a historicity to it because the text is written in a specific font. It's the script of uh, Islamic writing, Nastalik script. This Nastalik script is actually writing a Bengali uh, verse by a poet called Gyandas, and he is talking about Krishna in this, in this. And so there are layers of history and religion that are actually being brought together in these images. So we see that this is the intertextuality of his Krishna Leela paintings. In his later paintings, such as the Arabian Nights, this was also mentioned by Dr. Gupta, uh, which he called it Arabo uh, Rajuni. Uh, and this is being done in the 1930s, early 1930s. So you see here in the scene, this is uh, Shahrzadi is talking to her father to convince him to take her to the king and get her married. Uh, to him, and this is her sister, Dinar Sabi, and again, the calligraphy on the top. There is a same similar intertextuality. That calligraphy is in Urdu, and it is the kind of Urdu uh, which is spoken on the street from um, narratives that were being written 
uh, in street road to in, in India in Kolkata. In his later paintings such as the Arabian Night series of the early 1930s or his collaged manuscripts of plays such as Kutub Chapra which we just saw, we just saw this is another page from that very same book that uh, Dr. Gupta was talking about. Uh, the historical phenomenology is inscribed into the contemporary and the local. This is what he was talking about. You see that this epic tale has been transposed into our times. And you're getting a certain kind of a, a, a sort of palimpsest where a, a very different type of uh, socio-cultural uh, you know, flavor is merged with, with the epic, so to speak. It should be noted that many of these texts, along with the dialogue of image and text, I, are also referencing the performative. This is again what we saw uh, in Shoikov's presentation. He's talking about these folk rituals, right, which he's writing a book on and the diagrams, the images that belong to the folk ritual. So you can't take the image out of the ritual. Similarly, this page is actually the page of a text, a drama to be enacted. So it's, it's like the visual aspect and the reading aspect are connected with the performative aspect. So it's the image and the performance. All the three works mentioned about, and I also spoke about, uh, the Krishna Leela paintings which belong to the singing traditions, the Kirtan tradition, uh, are of this kind. The Krishna Leela paintings are each inscribed with titles and texts taken from books of Pala Kirtan meant to be sung. The Arabian Nights paintings are storytelling episodes inscribed with popular Urdu narrations and the Jatras are meant to be enacted. Three media, image, text and performance are thus engaged over a temporality that overcoats the present with the unfinished virtual memory of history. These are clearly cultural practices of postmodernism. However, even these practices appealed to an individual subject. So in a way that there is a certain individual subject involved, even though there is a certain challenging or complicating, though complicated with respect to rational agency and historical temporality. So that the historicity is challenged as well as the rational agency is challenged. Still, an independent individual subject is assumed. In this last phase of his life in Gupta Mibash, Abhinindranath seemed to find himself in a personal and historical landscape of destitution. A loss of context and consequent loss of text and of subject. And I am using the term subject both as a grammatical signifier as well as a, as a, a kind of an ontological signifier. The text is, the context is gone, the text is gone, the subject is also gone. Yeah. Mm. He had few, if any, companions from the past and experienced increasingly a sense of utilitarian abjection, the uselessness of waste. In his writings of this late period, we find him frequently using the words pala, meaning discarded, and paltu, meaning without utility. As if in a materialization of his subjective condition, shortly before his departure from Jorashanko, a little female street urchin walked uninvited into his darkened and mostly empty second floor quarters. He welcomed her and gave her the name Pala. After moving to Boranagor, he retired his brush and spent part of the morning walking around the rented house picking up natural and human debris or discards. He brought these to his room and spent a good deal of time inspecting them and working on them with small tools and touches of color. However, the finished products of these manipulations did not wear the looks of easily recognizable objects. 
crafted from objects of nature or human artifacts that had lost their social coding, they were seldom returned to the world of existing codes and contexts. Instead, they retained their liminal ambiguity as objects of potentia waiting to be born. Like them, the artist too, his coding erased in an alienated world, waited in latency for conditions of individuation. Such conditions were always unexpected and unpredictable and always temporary. And the individuations or heseities these conditions called forth were always new and always temporal. They most often included the arrival of children such as Pala or other little people, Khuddur or children, grandchildren into his world. To such arrivals, Abhinindranath often introduced these objects, sometimes calling them Katum Kutum and sometimes Kutum Kata. Kat translates as wood and kutum as relative, but katam bears also the connotations of kata or kat as well as kathamo, frame or type. Thus relatives in wood, crafted wood relatives or relative typologies. To these human friends or relatives, he would introduce his wooden relatives with typal names given in performative improvisations of fictioning in which temporal ontologies involving himself, the object and the addressee would manifest as states of aspiration or darshan. The performance over, the object, the addressee and himself would lose their names and return to a state of potentia awaiting new conditions for collective individuation. Rani Chondo, a young girl and intimate of the family, has written a book on such objects. I'm indebted to Dr. Gupta for providing me that book, which is very difficult to obtain at this point. Uh, and some descriptions of the performances in which Abhinindranath mobilized them. Here, for example, is a description of a first encounter related to these relations in wood. Quote, Abhinindranath said, I I'm, I'm, by my translation, I'm not reading the Bengali. I have captured a stork today. A twinkle of laughter in his eyes, he said, what a beautiful stork. The smile now touched his lips, he said, both wings outspread, he is flying an endless journey. Abhinindranath stops a while and starts again. He is journeying in the blue sky. Over sun-dazzled cornfields, he is journeying. All alone, he is journeying. Laughter lights once more his face. You see, Abhinindranath makes to lift his right hand from where it lies on his lap and retracts his gesture. Again lifted, again put back. In that raising of an arm as though the magic of stock revelation is hidden. Such is his pretense. Avanindranath's hand makes minor movements and I become anxious with expectancy. Avanindranath casts a surreptitious glance into the front pocket of his Punjabi and lifting a somber head, raises his gaze to the sky. But for me, I have clearly understood that in that front pocket is the mysterious stork that is flying in the blue sky, and forever flying. I am agitated with curiosity. Moving his hand casually towards the front pocket, Abhinindranath says, Oh, so you'll see his hand gradually proceeding towards the pocket. Okay, then let's show you. And once more he withdraws his hand. No, Baba, let it be, he says. Expressing raptness through both his eyes, oh, what glory of those years of corn in the morning sunlight. 
and how beautiful his call as he flies. Now I'll show you, shall I show it to you? So saying Abhinandranath in one moment, in reality produces from his pocket a box. A square, flat, thin, black and white cigarette box with black stripes prevalent in those days, packing inside 10 cigarettes side by side. With the closed box in his hands, he begins smiling. Shall I open it, he says. But what if it flies off? Well, let's open it. Caution, don't speak. It will be upset if it hears humans. See, I hope, I hope there is no one else around. The thing is not for all to see. So saying, resting the box on the flat of his left palm, okay, let's open it. But keep watch, it doesn't fly off. So saying, with great trepidation, he opens the lid with his right hand. He says, now see, a tiny stork chipped out of wood, strung on fine wire, its two ends fixed to the two ends of the box. At the center, the tiny stork on the shiny tin plate, as though against an infinite sky, is flying alone, spreading its two wings on two sides. Avanindranath holds his left hand, which has the box with the stork a little higher. See, hear how it calls as it flies. So saying, he begins to undulate his hand very slowly. The knots of the wire, when rocked, touching the body of the tin plate, set off a sweetly stirring reverberation. Kong, kong. Abhinindranath says, did you hear? And here, see how the corn field shimmers in the sunlight. The ears of corn sway in the breeze. On the shining tin plate, the play of light, light and shade has made to appear paddy fields, vast stretches, infinite horizons. In that tiny black and white box, making the stalk fly through the finite and the infinite, Avanindranath laughs and I laugh. To theorize this activity in terms of cultural production, one needs to note the inadequacy of categorizing it either as found wood sculpture, abstract expression, or performative art. The first two are static objects of display and aesthetic consumption. Even if they are forms of restitution, they code the uncoded or recode the decoded. Returning the object to the humanist ontology of independent subjecthood, of which it was a discard. Here instead, outside the performance, the object loses its code once more, returning to the state of destitution. The third, performative art, is mostly a critical intervention which belongs equally to the human, humanist ontology of independent subjects. But usually when we talk about performative art, it's, it's a critical performance. It also belongs to the humanist ontology. It is only certain forms of performative arts of participatory fictioning that open up a genre to which these object performances are more appropriate. As visual creations, these objects are potential in relation. Forming abstract typologies, these are genetic typologies. These are not structures that are static, they're genetic structures. Abstract typologies that express singular qualia under specific spatio-temporal conditions. Instead of seeking a new coded subjecthood in a new humanist ontology, Avanindranath through these practices held out a nomadic refusal of code, a retention of imperceptibility, waiting for local and temporal conditions for creative performances of collective individuation with the cultural discards of diasporic scattering. Such nomadic individuations hold the sing signal for a post-human polity of creative anarchy. This is a kind of a hint in that direction. However, 
lacking an intuition of the typologies formed by the related potential and hence the performances giving them singularity and individuation, they return to being discards. This is what in fact has happened after his passing. To the most, to mo most of the remaining examples of our Abhinandanath's found wood relatives, names lost, locked in glass cabinets in museums, may have returned to the uncoded imperceptibility and destitution from which they came. I end with a few examples of Katum Kutum from Rani Chando's book. So you can see some of these examples. And in fact, she has retained the names. So that is one aspect of them. At least if you know the name, it, you, you suddenly capture the sense of how this can be used in a performance and how there is a certain kind of realism to it the more you look at it. But if you didn't know the name, you wouldn't even know how it can how, be used. How big are they? Little like things. Little, little. Yeah, little yeah. things. But you would know that that was an animal. You could see that it's an yeah. animal, yeah. A cricket. <laughs> And these were made when? 41 to 51. Ah. And he named the dog. So, so they're named only during the time of the oh, performance. So this is one example. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you said that, yeah, right there. So it can mm -hmm. decode itself again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A horse. And then the question, who named, like, did you add this? No, this is the, the, the book. person. The yeah, the okay, person. Sorry, yeah. The, the, the person I quoted. So he gave a lot of these to, to her afterwards and she kept them. Is she the only one who wrote it down? Uh, no, a few people did, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, I think that's it. This is a, a, a actual photo of Rabindranath and I'm showing this because you see a certain posture in which he's characteristically shown in profile with a slight stoop and Rabindranath is going to use this, 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 this type, this typology you may say, to make uh, his own replicas of his uncle. This is one of them, Lobika. As if he's stooping over. And this one is Rabindranath on a boat. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, I think we are out of time, but if there are some questions or if there are some comments, even from the participants, maybe we can take a, a kind of five minutes or so. <clears throat> Thank you, Devajish. That was so interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious about um, when you read the quotation about this little cigarette box, I mean, I had a very felt experience of, mm. of this mm. object that was created and, and experiencing it. And it's interesting to think if he had intentions to have it spoken like that. That even without this object in front of Yeah, him, because that's a way of, that, that, that's its own immortality. Right? Yeah, it, yeah. it sort of uh, keeps it alive. Uh, so that, that's also an oral performance, but it's a written down oral performance, as it were. Mm -hmm. So that, that's very interesting, and I'm not sure whether he intended it, probably didn't. Mm -hmm. And he was sharing it mostly, as I said, with children. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, maybe he was going to inspire them to make something out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, that's a good question. Yeah. Don't know interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to also mention about the, 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 the folk, uh, I mean, the Alpona because this, that, that in, a, in a way is similar. Uh, they are also temporary, uh, mm. firstly they are rituals of participation, as I mentioned. Uh, they are not 
rituals of mediation, which is what pujas are. These are people, uh, collectively, particularly women, and one of the th he makes a distinction between Aryan and non-Aryan. It's part of his amateur anthropology, right? So Vedic and non-Vedic, Aryan and non-Aryan, and he's saying that this is non-Aryan performance, and in the sense that uh, the non-Aryan performances he's saying in the text are, have been wiped out, but particularly it has been retained by uh, you know Kurna Brutu. In other words, maiden, unmarried women's, uh, because they're the they're, they're the least noticeable in that in society. They're the ones whose rituals live on today. Mm -hmm. And it's done by them collectively, so they kind of produce these designs which are nature, which are kind of like mimetic of nature, but at the same time they are participatory and they mediate between nature and humanity, culture and nature, and produce these forms of aspiration. And forms of individuation. And so in that sense, these rituals, uh, they're rituals of individuation. Please have a related. Yes, Margaret. And after well, the first, I just wanted to thank all of you. I felt like a a cup in which knowledge was being poured. There were so many facets that um, of integral consciousness that was shared by all the presenters. I want to thank you. Um, and interestingly, Debashish, you going last was like an emphasis of all the previous points being made, and especially the quote and experience of, of the little girl watching <clears throat> the cigarette case. The experience of that, it wasn't just you reading. We, we were experiencing the fly. <laughs> anyway, it was profound in that sense and demonstrated his brilliance, his genius, and his consciousness. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, if you say a little bit more about the difference between trans subjectivity and dramatic subjectivity? Because in terms of some of the larger theme, in terms of finding and building an alternate happiness, happiness one would be more opening beyond the confines of the decoding, but then talking about how is it that Again, this, this the act of you know, disrupting, that was another thing, continuity, continuity, discontinuity, but this disruption and this, the idea of without utility or without subject, yeah. it, it kind of the way I'm hearing is it gave him an opportunity to disrupt that. And it seems like fictioning when you said that is really a, a link between that goal of becoming, but opening you to the unthinkable goal, which is the act of creative act. You know, actually, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm posing it as a post-human act in which uh, there's a collective individuation taking place. But we may question that as well, because in a way, the collective individuation is kind of, you know, the collective is partly the non-human itself, but the non-human orchestrated by the artist. See, because he's, He's, he's claiming interaction, he's giving it life, you know, that, that's also what we were talking about with regard to uh, Sharkot and uh, Shantanu Babu's papers, that, you know, the, the non-human is not poor of world, you know, the non-human belongs to the world equally as in challenging Heidegger's understanding. And, and you know, it comes into the world because it's, it's not a kind of a in position, it's not uh, a hylomorphism, mm -hmm. you see. So it, 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 it has its own uh, vitality, its own animism, which is uh, participating in this individuation. And the child's vitality is also participating in the individuation. But it is not, not neither of these are participating at the same level of participation and agency as the artist, you see. So a truly collective or true collective individuation uh, would, you know, have a, maybe a, even a nomadic subjectivity of a more full uh, agency, I, I feel. 
And then the other thing is that uh, with regard to nomadic subjectivity and trans-subjectivity, uh, you see Deleuze is talking about nomadic subjectivity when he's in anti-Oedipus, when he's talking about the war machine. And the war machine is in a relationship with the state uh, in our times because we can hardly expect anything more. See, it's, it's becoming imperceptible and finding the, the, the strategies to individuate under totally universalized conditions that are hostile. But uh, if you're going to talk trans-individuation, we, we have to think about alternative habituses uh, that can last, that can have some sustaining power. So this is, it's almost like uh, it is better not to have a code than to be appropriated in your code. You know, this term appropriation was used. It's as soon as you have a code, you will be appropriated. This is, this is the story of all the revolutions of our time. And in a way, Deleuze, most of his work is addressing the revolution of 1968 and the fact that it was immediately appropriate. So how do we remain un inappro unappropriated by, you know, refusing uh, coding, remaining imperceptible? And so these are temporal acts of individuation. That's why they're nomadic. But on the other hand, if they could find some security, they could, they could be a collective, um, you know, I mean, understanding of this kind of a collective individuation. That would be a trans individuation. That would have some sustaining power. Create another world. This other people. This world of another people. Any other? Any comments, discussions from the participants? Sasha has a comment. Sasha. It makes me think about um, processing speed and like neurological makeups. And I'm curious about if, if he had a neuropsychological evaluation, how they would discover his processing to be, because it makes me curious about the way to go back to the beginning of your lecture about the use of the senses, not as a uniting force, but to allow them each to have their own. And that in that, it takes space to access that, yeah. kind of knowing through the senses in that way, and, and that with a slower processing speed, yeah. A person is able to better or more naturally do that. Do that. Yeah. But it's, I it's a very interesting very question. Interesting. And you can actually see it in some of his texts. Yeah. You know, I mean, he was also a writer. We did not, I mean, of course, the Jata texts are written texts, but he was also a literary writer. Mm -hmm. So, and those literary texts are very hypnotic. You know, he, he says, actually, I write images. And the way in which he writes those images, actually, if you go through them, they speed up and slow down. You know, there's a way in which they mess with your sense of time. You know, and sometimes they become more hypnotic and sometimes they actually become faster. Uh, and I think that entire uh, question, I think in these all these works that we are discussing, we are seeing how he is uh, actually intervening in your neurological process. Yeah, yeah that's what yeah, I you, that. He's kind of, uh, you know, forcing you to change your conditioning. Mm -hmm. And that's very post-human too. Yeah, right. This that's, experience. That's, that's sort of between the post-modern and the post-human. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, thank you very much.